Today, we discuss crisis management, communications, and media relations with Bill Wall, a world expert on this topic. Just briefly, tell us about your background and what your focus has been over, over these years. I've spent the vast majority of my career, Michael, working in corporate communications, and most people have a good understanding of what that role is. We help companies with their messaging, their relationships with the media and external audiences, and of course, increasingly social media. And communications people are often pulled into the most uh, unusual and difficult circumstances when crises arise. And you know we've all been uh, watching what has been a tumultuous year because of the pandemic and the relatively unstable political situation in the United States. And so there's been lots of discussion about crisis and crisis communications. Now I run a consultancy uh, that helps companies think about how to handle crisis how to counsel their CEOs and how to set up and manage communication teams that are best prepared for that. When we talk about crisis management, crisis communication, what do we mean by a crisis? When do you kind of ramp up into that mode? My perspective is that a crisis happens at most companies zero times a year. Uh, And what I mean by that is uh, a true crisis is one that has an impact on the company's total valuation, if you're a publicly traded business, and overall reputation. Uh, That's what we would call in the public company world a material event. It changes people's viewpoint on the company so substantially that it requires a specific and different response. I firmly believe that most companies go through a series of business events every year, and those business events can be as simple as a software glitch, or a customer goes down, Um, or a mid-level executive changes jobs, or a new product is announced, and they don't warrant a full-blown crisis response. But if a CEO dies in a plane crash, if an activist shareholder makes a play for the company's stock, uh, if your company is accused of theft on a grand scale, for any business, public or private, that requires a different kind of response. And to give you a specific example, when I worked in communications at SAP, a company you closely followed as an industry analyst, We had a viewpoint that crisis was zero to one time a year, but we had 250 business events a year. Almost every day, something was happening somewhere around the world with SAP. And the importance of that distinction is to not get too distracted by the day-to-day and leave that special crisis response for when it's most needed. Then would it be correct to say that a crisis is something that affects the business as a whole, as opposed to say, one business unit? Perhaps. Ultimately, for me, the test is, does it change substantially the perception, the reputation of the company in the eyes of its critical audiences? And those audiences are internal and external. And if it rises to that test, it's most likely a crisis. Who decides that we need to go into crisis mode? I think companies that have good discipline about this have a group of people that can quickly gather together and make that distinction. Uh, I find that that should not just be a decision left to the head of communications or even to the CEO who has a business to run. And so often I would recommend that people have a core group of maybe three or four executives that work well together, typically communications, legal, human resources, Um, those who are the most trusted advisors to the leadership team. And they can usually make a very quick assessment. Let's call in the crisis team. This is big. Or let's assign someone to handle this and move on. Speed is important there. All right. So something bad has happened and the team has gotten together and they've ascertained all right, this is not just a run-of-the-mill business event. We're going to have to pull out all the stops, and essentially we're declaring an emergency. Right? Is that the way to, to talk about it or no? Every situation is different and unique, but at the end of the day, there is that moment where you say, okay, we're in it now. Let's get started. And this is where I think companies that have do a really good job in crisis set themselves apart because they've done preparation. The very best example, I think, are airlines. I think airlines intuitively understand that the ultimate crisis for them is an aircraft down. And all of my experience working around and meeting and talking to people in the airline industry, these are folks who have volumes of plans that outline what is required because that type of crisis 
will always generate a huge media response. It involves federal authorities, wherever the plane happens to go down, the US and internationally, uh, and, and is a crisis of enormous magnitude. So they've got volumes of crisis planning and they rehearse this all the time. Simply the challenge of responding to thousands of press inquiries and sorting through which of those are the most important with teams both at the crash site and back at headquarters requires a lot of preparation where I think companies struggle a little bit because everybody will reach that moment where they say, okay, we're in a crisis, is are you ready to now to take the next step? Have you thought that through? And it doesn't require that every business generate an airline size crisis plan, but a once a year tabletop exercise so that people actually stretch those muscles and understand what it means to be in the midst of working with your colleagues on an unexpected event uh, is really important to set a, set companies who are prepared aside from those that are not. All right. So we've pulled the switch. We've made, we've determined that this is of sufficient magnitude that we need to go into crisis mode. What do we do? Obviously, it depends on the circumstance, right? And And it depends on the group of people and the enormity of the challenge. And typically it does require a division of labor. Um, in my experience, one of the first things to do is to very quickly have something to say. You know, we live in a world of real time social media and transparency. So the audiences that matter to the company are gonna need to hear from the company absolutely as quick as possible. I'll give you a good example. And I'm gonna turn back to an airline example. I'm fortunate enough uh, to have met some of the great people who run communications at Southwest Airlines. And they will often talk about the crisis situation involving a plane that left Dallas-Fort Worth Airport once traveling westbound and the roof of the 737 rolled back simply because of metal fatigue. Um, you can imagine that's a pretty scary situation. Think of the sunroof on your car suddenly opening, but now you're in a plane at 10,000 feet with hundreds of people on board. The airline learned of this pending disaster because of the social media tweets of, of passengers on board. And that's because the pilots were so consumed with saving the aircraft, they didn't have time to contact their operations center. They have the radios to do that. They were busy trying to save the plane. Why do I tell this example? Because the social media monitoring team at Southwest Airlines were the first to learn of it. And who typically staffs? a social media monitoring team, a bunch of 25-year-old kids who are on the front line every day of dealing with delayed flights and angry passengers. They were trained well enough to be given the authority to say, we are aware of an emergency on our aircraft, which is unfolding. Our thoughts are with the passengers. We will provide more information as soon as it's available. In the old days, Michael, company lawyers would have taken hours to even approve a statement like that. And yet these youngsters on the social media team, as well trained as they were in crisis, knew that it was important for the airline to speak quickly. And so back to your question, speed then becomes important. What do you know that's important? What do you know that allows you to say something and then be ready to constantly be evolving that message as the crisis unfolds? We have a question from Twitter, and uh, I love taking questions from Twitter and from LinkedIn. So Arsalan Khan says, do you consider a data breach to be a crisis beyond just providing credit monitoring services to those affected? What are the best practices you've seen in response to data breaches? So we're going kind of down to a very specific example, but I think it follows very closely, Bill, to what you were saying earlier about evaluating, uh, determining what's a crisis and what is merely a business event? I think it's a, it's a timely question because many companies are going through that. And, and in recent weeks, we've seen this on, a, on an international scale. I, when I was at uh, United Rentals, we went through uh, a fishing incident and it was a large one. And it didn't happen because of anything that we did at United Rentals, but it did impact a lot of our customers. I do think that data breaches rise to the level of crisis simply because they involve uh, the, the trust equation that exists between companies and their customers. And what's important in those circumstances is to as fast as possible determine the extent of the breach and the potential for loss. It also goes to the trust equation that, that customers have with a brand 
uh, to assure that the transactions between the businesses are valid, appropriate, and, and of course, safe. And that's why it does rise to crisis. The good thing about data breaches is that while they all may be slightly different, the response to them is the same. Uh, it, and you can plan for a data breach. It's, that's one of those circumstances in which you can say, all right, let's practice how that would be. What would we say as a company? What experts would we bring in? And who are the people involved in assuring that systems can be rapidly uh, taken down, fixed, and returned to service? It's both predictable. Almost every company is under attack almost every day. And so a company that isn't prepared for a data breach crisis at this point um, really has questions that should be raised because this one is easy to plan for. So again, it comes down to that planning that you were discussing earlier. So tell us, tell us more about that. I think that in the early days of crisis planning, everyone had multiple three ring binders full of plans that outlined people responsibilities, division of labor, um, chain of authority. Those things are all so important. Um, at the beginning, it was all about the size and scope of the plans. Today, it's really about the flexibility of the plans because the unusual nature of transparency of business today requires a lot more communication than it did in the past, when the School of Crisis Communication was first built, you really could get your arms around a crisis and, and put a halt uh, to a story and get it corrected. But given the proliferation of social media and the speed of the internet and the inability of the media to be able to afford beat reporters who have a deep understanding of your business, the requirements to communicate are, are much, much steeper. The number of audiences involved in that you have to communicate to has also grown. In the, in the in previous eras, there was less concern about talking to employees and more concern about talking to the press. Today, every audience is a critical stakeholder audience. And uh, I could give you an example where, which I think would be really important. Uh, when I worked at Commvault, we experienced a um, activist shareholder attack. And in putting together the response to shareholder activism, which itself is its own unique science, one of the things that was really important to us was to make sure that everyone in the company had something that they could say. The reality is that every business, customers call the front desk and a receptionist answers the phone. They often are asked questions. Frontline salespeople are dealing with uh, open uh, deals that require needs to be closed and customers are gonna ask questions about the crisis situation. Salespeople need to be armed with something to say. Average employees will go to backyard barbecues and be asked by their neighbors, hey, I hear your company had a data breach or is being attacked by a shareholder, is your job safe? They need uh, to, to have something to say because ultimately they're all active on social media, they're all talking to customers and everyone needs to be on the song, same song sheet uh, on messaging. So. Those of us that are in the crisis world understand how important it is now to arm uh, our frontline people. Uh, at SAP, we started a program I called the Heads Up Alert. We had those 200 business events every year, Michael, I talked about earlier. Uh, the list of people receiving the morning Heads Up Alert was in the thousands. And our commitment to the business was within one business day, less than 24 hours, you will hear from communications about what has taken place, why it matters to the business, and what you're allowed to say. And I think that's a good discipline for any company to be prepared for a crisis. Raj asks, what is your opinion of newsjacking in the event of a crisis in the industry? Crisis creates an opportunity for the company under crisis and for its competitors. Um, and there certainly is a tactic that competitors will and can use uh, against you in a crisis. Uh, this is why I feel it's so important to talk to salespeople. Uh, very often a competitor will quickly um, use a crisis at company A if they work for company B to go after company A's customers. Uh, they'll go in and talk about the fact that company A will now be distracted by this crisis and it's time to do business with company B. Uh, I've actually also seen companies try to take a more positive spin uh, and position themselves as better around the issue than the company that is facing the crisis. Uh, look, I, those of us in business all want to be treated fairly. And I, I don't believe in taking advantage of a competitor's crisis. If anything, as an industry player, uh, a company should be supportive even of a, of a competitor uh, 
uh, when those situations occurred. And I, I'm not sure that that's exactly what Raj was asking about, but I, I hope it's a good answer to the question. Well, he has a follow-up. He says, how do you respond if a newsjacking takes place? So we've seen a great deal of that in the last few weeks in cybersecurity, which then also implies that not everybody shares your viewpoint or maybe or your integrity or ethic, ethical view around the use of newsjacking. And maybe, Bill, can you explain what that is? I, look, I, I think anytime you an organization purposely tries to ride the coattails of a situation to their own advantage, you are to a certain extent hijacking it in a positive sense, Michael. Um, you can also look at uh, uh, how companies would do that in a situation where there was good news and they try to ride that news stream to their advantage. Let me take it back to the, the topic at hand, which is crisis management. I think it's important for CXOs, whatever role they're in, to keep their company focused on preserving and enhancing and protecting their own reputation and not worry so much about what's happening around them. There's no doubt that there will be grenades thrown across the fence when you're under attack as a business. We saw that at, at SAP and I can talk about that. But in the end, you have to stay focused on the situation at hand. What has happened? Why has it happened? What does it mean to your business? How do you explain it to your stakeholder audiences? And then how do you make it right? Look, we're all human beings. Everyone makes mistakes, which means in business, companies will make mistakes. You've covered that as analysts. And while it might sound traditional to say it, how companies respond to those mistakes really speaks to their core business values and reputation and leadership. And so the response to the mistake needs to be the focus of the effort, not the distractions on the outside. You're approach is collegial and gentlemanly, gentlemanly, and maybe a little bit old school. I don't mean that in a negative way at all, but old school, traditional of having integrity and, and ethics. Look, let's be clear at the end of the day, crisis, crisis can happen to anyone. And so the tables can easily be turned. And so the right behavior when your competitor is in crisis uh, is to be supportive because it's pretty easy for the shoe to be on the other foot. We have a very interesting question from Marissa Baum, and she says, can we talk about crisis communication in terms of social justice? Companies have had to answer for either past wrongdoings or to speak about current events. How can we plan for this? How do you make sure that the message comes across authentically? It's a great question. It is. and and. Frankly, Michael, you could have an entire program just on that topic. But just today, and, and we're recording uh, today's program, we're having this program today in the wake of uh, uh, the storming of Capitol Hill. Uh, and someone may watch this program six months from now, so I wanted to provide the date context. Uh, I can give you an example that's happened in the last 24 hours. Um, it's a company called Goosehead Insurance. I've never heard of them before, and I've never worked with them. But one of their employees was involved in storming the Capitol uh, 24 hours ago. And we know that because he recorded a video of himself doing that. Um, Goosehead fired him. Uh, he was a lawyer for the company. So he wasn't an average employee. He was one of the company's executives. Now Goosehead finds itself in the middle of a huge firestorm of press coverage uh, because one of their employees was socially active. Um, and why are they in the midst of it? Well, not only was the employee a lawyer for the company and they had to publicly terminate him, but the media's coverage behind the scenes has now uncovered that the executive staff at Goosehead, including the CEO and his wife, were significant contributors uh, to the president and the Trump re-election campaign. Now, why that doesn't really matter in its own right in the context of this lawyer being involved on Capitol Hill makes Goosehead right in the middle of this big news cycle, and that's a problem. Um, I would tell you that one of the things that I advise clients on responding to these social justice issues is to be really, really careful about topics involving uh, politics. Um, and they need to be true to their brand. And what I mean by that is if a company or a CEO as a spokesperson has typically been quiet on political or uh, green issues to suddenly make a statement on a topic out of the blue will feel out of character or out of brand. Uh, 
And that's typically when companies get themselves into trouble because their audiences sit up and take note that something has changed. And then the tough questions, why are you saying this now? Why haven't you said this in the past? Why are you talking about this one issue when you never actually talk about social issues? And so in the midst of a crisis, one of the roles of the communications officer is to make sure that the statements being generated, whether they come from legal or from HR, are consistent with the character of the company on an ongoing basis so that they don't inadvertently signal a shift that is unintended. And that's particularly true on social issues. When you have these kind of emotional situations and the CEO or the senior leadership spokesperson says to you, you know, Bill, here's how I want to do this. And you say, well, no. In the heat of the moment, does that spokesperson listen to you and follow your advice? If I'm working as a consultant, ultimately the, the company makes the final decision about conducting its business. In, in between the lines on that question, Michael, is, is ultimately one of the critical issues that is faced by chief communication officers, which is to have the necessary status as a trusted advisor to the C-suite to be able to give very tough counsel. Uh, and not every chief communication officer is in the position to be able to say to the CEO, I think you're wrong here, and here's why. And that's why that work needs to be done in advance of the crisis. Uh, it's really important for the communications team to be in a position to be trusted enough to say, we're doing this wrong, and here's why. Now, you don't always win those battles, but what's important is that communications represents the viewpoint of the outside world. This is what people are saying about us. This is how this is going to be perceived when we say it, and that that's part of the decision equation on deciding how to respond to the crisis. Even when you don't get your way, that point of view needs to be represented. I can remember, and it's been reported uh, so I'm not telling any secrets here, but when I was the chief communication officer at HP in the moment of the greatest crisis, uh, I gave communications advice that resulted in the CEO throwing a chair at me. Uh, and that's a true story. Uh, he didn't actually throw it at me to hurt me. He threw it across the room in frustration because of how the board reacted to the advice I had given him. That was high stakes, right? Um, but that meant that I was giving really tough advice in a very difficult situation, but I had standing in that room to do that. Now, most CCOs will not get chairs thrown at them, but the point is you have to have the ability in a crisis to offer tough advice when it's most needed. And one other thing I would say to this particular question you raised, it's important that someone be the calm in the center of the storm. In a major crisis, it's a lot like a hurricane. And you know, in a hurricane, there are hugely revolving winds of the storm. And the closer you get to the center of the hurricane, the more intense the winds become. In a corporate environment, the closer you get to the conference room of the C-suite, the stronger the winds become. You as the crisis leader have to be the eye of the storm because the eye of a hurricane, the winds are still, the storm is circling around you, but you have to be the person who does not bring emotion and energy but brings sound advice based on experience. And, and that's where crisis leaders need to be. Hearing about the CEO ch throwing a chair across the room, that's definitely a first for me. It's all about perspective, um, Michael. And I think perspective is important. Business crises are just that, they're business. You know, because we've known each other for many years, in my private life, I'm a volunteer firefighter and I've done that for nearly 40 years. One of the things that volunteer firefighting gives me is the perspective of life and death and the difference between true emergencies and emergencies. And when you're on a, an auto crash scene and someone's entrapped in a car or you're standing in front of a house that's on fire and there are people trapped, that's life and death. When you're in the midst of a business crisis, I can bring that perspective in and say, hold on folks, take a big breath here. This is just business. The, the, the day will end, the sun will go down, and it will come back up tomorrow, and we will move on as a business. Let's take a deep breath and find a solution. Um, because while it may feel like life and death, maybe the CEO gets fired, maybe the shareholders sue you, maybe your largest competitor accuses you of theft on a grand scale, but it's still just business. 
and life goes on. And that perspective uh, from my private life has been really helpful to me in the midst of some of the most difficult business situations I've faced over 30 years of doing this. We have a question on Twitter from Barbara Bates. And Barbara asks, she says, so many crises that we're dealing with are external to the business. What role does corporate communications have in helping companies decide how to address or even whether they should address a particular external event as a genuine crisis? I, we live in a very complicated world, uh, Michael, and I think Barbara's question is a good one. And it's complicated uh, for lots of reasons. The, the pace of change in the world is constantly evolving geopolitically, uh, from a climate perspective, from a business regulatory perspective. One of the important roles of corporate communications people and the agencies that support them is to monitor all of that and get a sense of its direct impact on the company. The, the temptation of course, is to always somehow decide that whatever's happening in the world impacts the business and should be commented on. But in the end, there has to be a test about the appropriateness of attaching your brand to a particular issue or situation. Does it fit the character and culture of your company? And is the risk associated with jumping in worth the potential upside uh, of jumping in? And you could say that the opposite way, right? If staying out is uh, a safe thing to do, but then are you perceived by your stakeholder audiences for failing to get involved in an issue uh, that might be important? And w- what's going on? What's gone on in the United States for the last eighteen months is a perfect example. It's a huge election cycle. A lot was at stake. Employees have typically been polarized. They were either pro-Trump or anti-Trump. Um, those workforces were asking, were their leaders uh, leaning one way or the other? And did the company take a particular position? And for many companies, the temptation to say something was very real. Um, unfortunately, getting companies involved in political discussions is fraught with risk. And the same could be said of the pandemic, which had a direct impact on businesses. And I think that sort of forced people to be engaged in the issue. Um, but the the move of the social justice issues that a private questioner raised, uh, the issues of uh, green policies, even the issue that relates directly to what we're talking about, transparency uh, for employees, uh, all of those issues have potential positives and negatives. And communications people and the agencies that support them really need to think through those issues and determine what makes sense to be involved in. And you can see, I I really try to prioritize the questions that come in over my own. We got such great and insightful questions very often. Kawaja Sheikh says, it is the responsibility of leaders to communicate effectively with those affected during a crisis. He says, crisis creates opportunities to strengthen your relationship with your people. So what do you think about that, the, the notion of, a, of crisis as a mechanism to strengthen the leader's relationship with, with the organization? It's an opportunity to build relationships further than they may have been in the past. It's also an incredible risk to screw it up. Um, and I say that just being honest, because some company executives are horrible communicators and may miss the opportunity uh, to do exactly what this uh, commenter is talking, the, com- uh, the, the comment is talking about. Uh, you know, it, in a crisis, your employees, your shareholders, your customers, your partners, your stakeholder audiences are counting on you to do the right thing, respond appropriately, effectively communicate. If you do a good job at that, you can deepen and mature the relationships with those stakeholder audiences, no doubt. But there's also the risk that you don't do it correctly. And where companies tend to take their biggest reputational hits is when they don't handle the most difficult situations correctly. People can forgive the sort of day-to-day, but the expectation that the leadership team can conduct themselves appropriately in the midst of a crisis uh, is really important. One of the mistakes that companies tend to make in a crisis, and this goes right to the heart of this person's comment, is middle-level managers in the business love to sit on their hands during a crisis and allow the company spokesperson and CEO to parachute in uh, 
all the messages to employees. And that creates uh, a, a real gap between the top of the company and the frontline worker. And that's why I think it's so important in the midst of a crisis to remember that internal communications is absolutely as important exter as external communications. And we have to arm, not only arm, Michael, we have to demand that frontline managers meet with their people. So example, the CEO makes a statement publicly, sends an email out to the whole company. Here's our response to this crisis. Immediately, the frontline supervisor for this team of 12 people should call those folks into a room and say, let's talk about what the CEO just announced and what does that mean to each of you? Do you have questions? Can we talk about what he or she just said and what it means to us in our function at the company? That too often does not occur uh, because we somehow give these middle managers permission to sit on their hands. A good crisis plan really involves every level of management so that employees, that critical stakeholder audience, feel like they've not only heard from the big boss, they've heard from the people that signs their paycheck directly. And that's an important uh, component and speaks directly to the point that was made on Twitter. You know, Bill, you made a comment that I think gets right to the heart of why this is so hard. And you said that the, the risk of screwing up crisis communications creates a horrible risk. That was the term you used, horrible risk which I think gets to the point of why this is so such an important topic. It does. And also why I think there needs to be the distinction between a crisis and a business event. Because in a crisis situation, you should have thought through response and responsibilities and roles. And you clearly don't want to put people in roles where they don't belong. Let me give you an example, and I'm going to go back to my firefighting experience to make the case, but I think people listening to this program will intuitively get it. What you learn quickly in the fire service, if you have 100 people in the fire department, there's about five of those 100 people that can hold the radio and wear the white hat and serve as the chief officer. They are born leaders. They understand the role and responsibility of the leader to direct the crisis at hand. There's a mass group of people out of that 100, I'm going to say 75 or so that really are not leaders, but they're committed to the cause and they go to training every week. And I, they're kind of what I call the fence sitters. And what I mean by fence sitters is, is if you give them good training and good direction, they will go into battle at a fire scene without any hesitation and they, will, they know how to work together and they do great work. And then the other, if I did the math right, 15 people, uh, they're the people who run around like chickens with their heads cut off, and they insert a lot of motion and chaos to a crisis. You don't want them on your fire scene. Now, if I adapt that same model to the corporate world of crisis response, there's always a few people who are the natural leaders in the business. They should be on the front lines. They should be the spokespersons and be providing direction. The people who add uh, emotion and concern and unnecessary energy, they need to be hidden somewhere in the back office. They're not even answering the phones. They might be writing copy and helping, but they need to be away from the core team. Then everybody else can get focused on doing their jobs, whether they're writing releases, answering the phones, conducting interviews, um, sending out briefing materials. That bell curve model of staffing uh, is really important. And, it, and the, when you insert leaders into that white hat role, and you put them in front of the microphone or you ask them to speak to stakeholder audiences and they're not prepared, well, in a crisis, the risk is they can damage the business and frankly, wreck their careers. When you're planning for a crisis, then we could say that the talent management aspect, the choice of spokespeople is crucial. And what are the criteria? Obviously, you just spoke about emotion, but clearly, uh, leadership in the organization, and there are other factors. So how do you choose the spokespeople? Well, in a true crisis situation, there is an expectation that people in certain roles are involved in being a spokesperson. And you start right at the top of the house with the, 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 with the CEO, and certainly the chief communication officer as the chief spokesperson. And then depending on the nature of the crisis, other executives can be expected to participate as spokespersons. So if it's a people-related crisis, like a labor issue or a strike, the chief human resources officer might be appropriate. If it's a legal matter, uh, the general counsel might be. 
Behind all of that, Michael, is something I call the spokesperson cascade, and I think it's really important. Uh, early on in a crisis is not the time to involve the CEO, even if it's the biggest crisis that the company has faced, uh, because you want to reserve the CEO for sort of the penultimate statement. The CEO should be able to come into the room, even deep into the crisis, and say, look, you've heard from everybody else, but I'm the boss. The, bus, the buck stops with me. Let me tell you what happened and what we're doing about it. And let me give you a perfect example of this. Uh, you'll remember 10 years or so ago, uh, Boeing Corporation launched a very famous new airplane, the 787. It, the Dreamliner was revolutionizing travel. What happened in the first week that the Dreamliner went in service? The lithium batteries in the belly began catching on fire. Now, this was a $200 billion investment by Boeing and highly public and planes were catching on fire. Uh, you live in Boston, Michael. You'll remember a Japan Airlines plane right there on the runway, live on television in flames. I was asked to comment during that situation about Boeing's response. And the concern that was being raised about the media is, where the hell was Jim McInerney, the CEO of Boeing? He had been the most visible proponent of the aircraft. But 10, 15 days after the planes were catching on fire, no one had heard from the CEO yet. I thought Boeing was incredibly smart in how they did that because the first spokesperson they put forward was the designer of the plane, the engineer, the gentleman who was responsible for the engineer. He could answer difficult technical questions and he could work through those interviews because at that point, Boeing didn't even understand why the batteries were catching fire. So they were using a, I don't want to call him a junior leader because this was a gentleman who was highly uh, responsible at the company. So you start lower down and you work your way slowly up. Uh, another effective technique that Boeing used during that crisis is that they got their customers to go in front of the media and talk about their faith in the company. Um, the day before I appeared to talk about the Boeing uh, response to this crisis, Robert Crandall, who had been the chairman of American Airlines for 25 years, was a guest on Bloomberg. And he talked about the fact that he personally had purchased billions of dollars of Boeing aircraft. And he had complete confidence in Boeing engineering and Boeing as a company to respond to the crisis. Using third parties to step forward is also a way to avoid the CEO's participation until the right moment. And ultimately, Boeing CEO did comment, but he commented once the company completely understood why the lithium batteries were catching on fire and what the company was prepared to do to resolve the issue. And that's what I mean by the cascade of spokespersons. I often spoke for the brands I work for as the chief spokesperson, but I always knew that if I didn't get it right or the situation changed, ultimately the CEO could step in and say, well, you've heard from my PR guy, but I run the company. And even above the CEO is the chairman of the board. And so in a crisis, you use people based on the appropriate role, but you consider using third parties like customers to also support the situation. In a crisis, how open should we be? Uh, to what extent should a leader acknowledge that it's our fault? We screwed up. I think transparency is an expectation in today's world. Uh, and too often people tend to think about uh, PR as a way to hide problems. There is a level of transparency, obviously, that you need to take to support the business and its brand and reputation. And there's no reason to over communicate more than you need to say. But at the same time, in the midst of a crisis, you're trying to protect reputation, people's faith in your business. And honesty is a way to really get to the heart of the issue. And I want to give you an example that, that I lived for almost three years. Uh, when I was a communications leader at SAP, a uh, giant enterprise software company, Michael, you followed them. Um, we came into work one day to find an announcement from Oracle, our chief competitor, accusing SAP of theft on a grand scale. Uh, in their press release, they announced that SAP had stolen trade secrets of the company and they were suing us for multiple billion dollars. It was a shocking announcement. I'm sure you can probably even remember where you were that day. I know I can. Here's the thing. You think you're having a bad day and then 72 hours later, we figured out it was actually true. My company was guilty of theft. Um, that's a very difficult situation uh, to be in. Uh, 
Um, and of course, we didn't realize that at the moment the press release was issued. It took a little bit of digging, but ultimately we discovered that a small business unit of the company that was purchased for $100 million, a, a company we acquired, a few employees, 10 in fact, way down in Southern Texas, had actually taken some of Oracle's proprietary material. So here we are as an executive team faced with, well, we've been accused of theft. Most companies would say, well, we don't comment on pending litigation. And we did that for about 24 hours. But once you discover that you're actually guilty of it, you have a real choice to make. And the choice to make is really borne out by what is the ultimate resolution of this situation. Working closely with the executive team and the legal department, our goal was to protect the company's reputation, make sure this doesn't happen again, and not pay the $3 billion that Oracle was demanding. Um, and so ultimately, our communication strategy, which was linked tightly with our legal strategy, resulted in us advising the CEO of the business, us as communicators, in partnership with legal to issue a statement that was this. We're aware of the accusation by Oracle of corporate theft, and unfortunately, based on our investigation, we have determined that that indeed occurred. We're sorry, and we've taken immediate steps to make sure that it never happens again. We've also instituted a plan of action to make sure that the customers that were directly involved in this situation are transitioned in a way that protects their business and then, of course, we want to make sure that Oracle is appropriately compensated for the actual damages they experienced. You may remember that language from those days. That was the statement we used for the next 24 months all the way through the trial in federal court. And people were surprised that we, one, admitted that we were guilty, and two, that we wanted to pay Oracle. In the end, our strategy was to make sure that when this was all said and done, we weren't giving Oracle billions of dollars, but we were giving them what we estimated on the first week was probably a, a court case worth several hundred million dollars. And after four or five years, the case was ultimately settled for $350 million. During that period, Michael, and even while the case was in court, SAP enjoyed the best share price in the company's history up until that point. Why? because we were honest and transparent. And during that period, we were constantly surveying our customers and our customers never lost trust in us. Were they disappointed that it happened? Yes. Did they appreciate that we were honest with them about what took place and that we wanted to compensate Oracle? Yes. Um, and so that was an important lesson that speaks right to your question. And, and, and too often people assume that the crisis response is to say, hey, I didn't do it. It didn't happen. But if it did, best to be straightforward about it. What if there are legal implications of that? You know, you come out, somebody, somebody was killed, for example, in a factory. You come out and acknowledge that this happened and that the company was at fault. You immediately open yourself up to a lawsuit. Well, there's no question, but you're opened up to it no matter what. Uh, I think this is where ultimately in crisis, the, the importance of uh, planning and in particular partnerships elsewhere in the business one of the things I've learned over nearly 40 years in this business is that my most important partner in crisis planning is the general counsel. There's not a crisis that a company faces that does not involve a legal aspect and component to the situation. So I have to have a trusted working relationship with the general counsel. We need to share secrets on both sides. We need to be transparent with each other and we cannot have conflicting agendas. It would have been very easy in the SAP situation for the general counsel to say, we're being sued for billions of dollars, we're not gonna talk. And that would be a classic response from a lawyer. But I think the lawyers intuitively understood that for us to get to our strategic goal, which is to minimize the damages, it was important for us to communicate in a way that got us uh, to that uh, end goal. Uh, people often underestimate the importance of protecting the company's legal interests, but I would say this, which I think will make some general counsels cringe. Lawyers provide advice. You don't have to take it. Just like communicators provide advice that you don't have to take. This is why the CEO's job is so hard. Now, lawyers will say, well, if you don't take a lawyer's advice, you lose a lawsuit or you go to jail. I, I, okay, fine. Um, but you can't have legal dictate 100% the response of a crisis any more than you can have communications dictate 
100% of the response. And that's why having that core crisis team that practices is so important because in the end, the CEO is going to have to make a judgment. And if he looks around the table and his lawyer and his CCO are yelling at each other, he's in a world of hurt. Bill, we have a, another question from Twitter, a really interesting question related. And this is from uh, my colleague, Elizabeth Shaw. And Elizabeth says, what happens when company behavior is at odds with the crisis communications plan and messaging? Well, then you run the real risk that everybody gets in a world of hurt. Um, I think it's very easy to say it's important that your crisis response be consistent with the culture of the business. Um, but I, I don't think you can underline it more. Uh, the character of the company is the character of the company. And if your crisis response is out of step with that character or your character is out of step with the response needed, you're in a very, very difficult place. Uh, and and this is really an important topic because, you know, Companies that are sort of rotten to the core will always be rotten to the core. I, I always say that good communications can't solve bad business strategy. And even a good crisis response cannot resolve a complete failure of a company uh, to operate itself um, in a solid fashion. Let me go back uh, to uh, Oracle for just a second. And I have some good friends who worked at Oracle, but if I can take us all the way back to the 2000s and the 1990s. What did people know about Larry Ellison? Larry would pull any dirty trick in the book he could to, to build his business. Um, his people famously rooted through the trash at Microsoft at some point. And look, everyone understood that Larry was willing to do whatever it took to grow his business. And that's why he's one of the biggest brands um, and one of the biggest Wall Street successes that occurred. People would excuse Larry's behavior if he and his people were just a little bit on the edge. And as a competitor to Oracle at that time, uh, working for SAP, uh, a German-centered business, business ethics and the way we conducted ourselves were really important. So there was always that contrast between uh, SAP and Oracle in that battle. Uh, in the end, good behavior matters in business and companies that cannot step up to uh, good behavior will find themselves in crisis on a repeated basis. I think it's important for crisis leaders to always make sure that there is a gut check, that the way they're responding to the crisis feels like it fits with the business that has been done. This is really important because industry analysts like you and others will immediately suspect a business if the way they're responding to a crisis feels very different from the company they've gotten to know through the years. There's another lesson in this, and pardon me while I just extend the answer. You cannot build relationships of trust in the midst of a crisis. So part of good communications planning for crisis is to develop relationships with industry analysts, with reporters, with your stakeholder audiences. If you don't have a good reputation with those audiences, a good working relationship with business press, you can't develop those relationships in the midst of a crisis. So for example, if you're a public company and you're worried about activist shareholders, if you don't know the guy who writes about shareholder activism at the Wall Street Journal and you've not talked to him before, trust me, you don't want to have your first conversation with him with three o'clock on a Sunday morning saying, hey, I'm about to push the button on a story that will feature your company tomorrow morning. And I'll tell you how I experienced this, Michael, and this is a really important lesson for crisis. When I worked at Hewlett Packard and we were in the midst of a crisis at almost every day of Leo Apotheker's uh, tenure, I can remember getting a call from a Reuters reporter, I won't name him, but somebody that I worked with very closely through the years. And he called me and told me about something that he knew had happened at, uh, at HP, and he was prepared to issue a story. And I asked him to give me an hour to find out if it was true. And it turned out that it was true. And if he published the story, it would require us to issue earnings earlier and would have been really disruptive to the business. Because I had a relationship with that writer over many, many years, I was able to put context on the story he was writing because he trusted that I would be honest with him, because I was willing to say to him where we had screwed up as a business. You can't build those press relationships when the crisis is already taking place. That all has to be done in advance. That's why SAP got through the Tomorrow Now crisis, because over 30 years, it had convinced its customers, the media and analysts, that they were a business that conducted itself ethically and appropriately, 
And when they got a body blow of being guilty of theft on a scale, um, people were willing to forgive them and look beyond what was happening. You've mentioned media and analysts a number of times. What's the role of media and analysts when responding to a crisis? Well, they've got a job to do. I think good crisis communicators and good CEOs will understand that there is a conversation taking a place about your brand everywhere, in the press, online, among industry analysts, in social media. Whether you're in a crisis or not, that conversation is happening about your business. You can't stop that. And in fact, we're way past the days where communicators could actually control that conversation. What we can do is influence the conversation. And because uh, reporters and social media is a way to reach audiences that you need to communicate with during a crisis, it's important to use those channels appropriately to send the right messages. For example, if your company is facing a business crisis, you may not want to talk to the Wall Street Journal, but guess what? Most of the Wall Street analysts who watch your company and most of the people who own millions of dollars of your stock read the Wall Street Journal. So you really want to make sure that the Wall Street Journal's coverage of your crisis tells your side of the story. If you set them aside because, well, I don't want to talk to the press, we're in a crisis, well, then someone else is going to write your version of the story and you might not like what they have to say about you. So engagement is really important. We have another question from Twitter, and uh, this is again from Arsalan Khan. Arsalan's a regular listener to the show, and he asks great questions, and thank you for listening, Arsalan. And Arsalan asks, what about a crisis within a particular department that can affect the whole company? Do we need crisis response teams for internal departments to effectively communicate rather than just finger pointing? What's in the midst of the question is that the, de that the department crisis could impact the whole company. And when it does, it does involve uh, a potential crisis response. The challenge with crisis situations is as much as we can practice and prepare for them, you never quite know what a crisis is going to be until you get into the middle of it. And that's why you need a group of leaders who can use their experience and their training to ascertain uh, the depth of the situation and the potential broadening downstream of the risk. This is where I think people, to an earlier question that was brought up, get in trouble about uh, data breaches and phishing incidents. They often occur down within a business unit or at a particular location. Um, smart people understand that they, they will typically cascade into something much broader and much larger. And so the tough questions you need to ask within the first hour of a crisis is, what's going to happen next? Uh, and do we really understand that it stops here or do we, are we really not sure? And typically in a big corporation, people are always looking to sort of save themselves in front of management. So they hold back information and say, oh, this, this is no big deal. Uh, it'll go away. We've got this under control. Uh, where people in corporate headquarters have to ask questions is to really probe and say, well, well, what do you mean by under control? And what has really happened? I don't think it makes sense to set up crisis teams all over the place. And certainly if you're in a large corporation with big business units, um, let's say you're in General Motors and there's a truck division and there's a car division and there's a China division and there's a South America division, okay, they're very separate and disparate, probably billion dollar businesses on their own. Uh, they certainly need a, a communications infrastructure, but in the end, there is a core team that thinks about the GM brand overall. And it really is sort of an it depends answer to that question. We have a question from Twitter from Constance Woodson. She asks, what's the difference between chaos and a crisis? In the end, you still have to come back to whatever is going on, how does it directly impact the business? I think crisis situations can lead very quickly to chaos, um, but chaos doesn't always happen to lead directly to crisis. Um, how do I put that in context? I think emotion can overrun businesses pretty quickly and faced with a crisis like labor unrest or a lawsuit or something, um, ill-prepared executives can bring a lot of emotion in and suddenly a situation that should be easy to control sort of falls into chaos. You know, I, on day three, a large customer cancels. On day four, the head of sales says, uh, all the deals that we have in play have been canceled. 
uh, our year has been destroyed and very quickly it feels like the wheels are coming off. That's a crisis decaying into chaos. There are certainly situations where chaos don't necessarily have to turn into crisis. Let me use the pandemic as an example. None of us really understood on March 1st that what was happening in China would shut down the American economy. But as the weeks progressed, it became clear that the chaos of COVID was going to have an impact on all of our companies. The companies that were well prepared did not let the chaos overrun their business. They very quickly took sound business decisions and communicated on how they were going to adjust their business models in anticipation of the chaos, but they never let it become a crisis for their business. Not all companies can say that. More than a few really faced the chaos of the situation. And so the two are related, but they don't necessarily follow each other. And it ultimately goes back to situational chaos does not have to be a crisis for the business if you're well prepared and practiced, but a real crisis can devolve into chaos if you also have not well practiced and prepared. As we finish up, let me ask you just finally for two or three pieces of advice on crisis management, what you think are the most important takeaways for folks that are listening. We've talked extensively about preparation. And while I don't think most companies um, need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on crisis planning, I do think any smart business should have a communications leader. It's amazing to me, I still run into publicly traded companies that don't have a chief communication officer, but they need a crisis plan and they need to do tabletop exercises at least once a year to flex those muscles. So preparation is the first lesson. Um, The second lesson is there is nothing about asking for help that is a sign of weakness. We didn't talk about this earlier, but I'll touch on it briefly. As a head of communications, I don't really like to go to the CEO and say, I don't know what to do here. I need help. But in fact, during a crisis, this is exactly when you should turn to help. There are agencies that specialize in crisis, just like there are lawyers that specialize in law. Uh, No general counsel goes into court to defend an employee on a criminal charge. They hire a criminal attorney. So why would a communications person be uncomfortable asking for help in the midst of a shareholder activism situation? There are firms that specialize in that. So ask for help because you may need that help. And the third thing I would say is, don't forget to run the business, right? Go back to the SAP situation. We understood that the Oracle matter would be with us for at least 36 months. So we dedicated a team of business leaders and lawyers and communicators like me to focus on the Oracle crisis. And we told everybody else in the company, please go back to work and take care of our customers. We still have numbers to make for Wall Street. We still have deals to close. We still have software to build and deliver. And we have customers to take care of. To the question about chaos, if you let a crisis dominate you to the point where you stop running the business, well, why fight the crisis? The whole thing will implode. So don't forget in the midst of a crisis to still run the company. And that's the expectation of both your employees and your customers, and your shareholders. Those are three lessons that I think would be at the top of my list. All right, Bill Wall, very sage and very practical advice. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to thank Bill Wall. He is a great marketing leader, and I hope that folks listening have enjoyed this show. Thank you everybody for watching, especially the folks who participated and asked your questions. Be sure to subscribe to our newsletter. Hit the subscribe button at the top of our website and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's great information at cxotalk.com. And there's much more beyond that. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. We will see you soon. Take care.